Well, ladies and gentlemen, it's my pleasure to welcome everyone here this evening to the first of the Assembly <coughs> Commission's programme of events to mark a significant year of centenaries in 2021. Karja, Faljarova, Legashaw, Anukt. Specifically tonight, we launch a series of four lectures reflecting on the centenary of the creation of Northern Ireland, the North Partition, said as you're comfortable with, <clears throat> and the first sitting of the Old Stormont Parliament. I am delighted that the renowned Dr. Eamon Phoenix has again agreed to deliver the lectures, and I will come back to Eamon shortly. For some context, in 2020 and 2012, the then Speaker, Lord Willie Hay of Ballyower, initiated discussions between the parties to agree how events marking the decade of centenaries would be managed by the Assembly. And as a result, the parties on the Assembly Commission agreed a process and a set of principles which have been used consistently ever since. While inevitably the Assembly may not have been able to mark every centenary in Parliament buildings in a way that each party may prefer individually, overall those initial discussions and the agreed principles have more or less served the Assembly very well to hold a range of different centenary events over the last nine years. Sometimes when we talk about a centenary, of course, the passage of time is difficult to grasp. And I'm also struck that not long ago in this Assembly we were looking back on the same period in a different way as a lifetime, for example, to reflect on the long life of the Duke of Edinburgh. And I said then that throughout the past 99 years, the years of the Duke of Edinburgh's life, which encompasses the past centenary, we have all been on such a journey of change, tumult, challenge, opportunity, domestically in these islands and globally. Now, there is no doubt that the events of 1921 had a lasting impact on our politics, relationships and institutions in these islands for the 100 years that has followed. And in that context, I'm delighted to be joined tonight by the Speaker of the House of Commons in Westminster, the Right Honourable Sir Lindsay Hoyle, MP, and the Kion Kjorla of Dáil Oran, Sean O'Farrell, for this launch event. I will introduce both Sean and Lindsay individually later, but in a way, I think it underlines how far our relationships have come, that the three presiding officers of the legislature's most influenced by these events can join together to reflect upon them. Indeed, I also want to recognise that we are joined this evening in the audience by many MLAs, MPs and TDs. Even just a small practical sense, in just a small sense, I want to acknowledge and thank Sir Lindsay and Sean, as well as our counterparts in Scotland and the Wales, who are currently in the midst of elections, for the level of communication, cooperation and sharing that there is between our offices on common issues and challenges. As I referred earlier, there are different views in the Assembly on this year's centenaries, just as there are in our wider community. There are those who hold their British identity dear, for who this is a period of celebration, and I want to recognise that that ability to celebrate has been particularly frustrated by the pandemic this year. There are those who see themselves also as Irish, who do not view the partition as a positive legacy, and indeed their focus is on their aspirations for the future. And there are others for which the centenaries we are marking this year do not define how they see themselves in the same way. As Speaker, and I want to recognise the validity and the importance of all of those different perspectives. The Commission's previous centenary events have presented opportunities for us to learn and to discuss our history together. And I therefore welcome that we have had interest from hundreds of people to register for tonight's lectures, including, as I've said, MLAs, MPs, TDs, Assembly and Party staff, and very importantly, members of our wider community. We know that in this Assembly, we do not have to look too far to find issues that divide us, although that is often the case in Westminster and in the Dáil also. However, we can also use these opportunities as examples of how we can look forward to the future together. Of course, it may well be easier, and I know this, for me to say that through the independence and impartiality of the Office of Speaker. It is only last week that this entire Assembly came together in a very positive way in the Chamber to celebrate the achievement of our fantastic women's international football team qualifying for the Euros. One of the things that personally frustrate me, I have to say in this role, is that it is often only through our differences that the Assembly is defined, despite the many occasions on which members are working on issues together. So that is also something for us to think about through these centenaries. These centenaries give us the chance to look back, to reflect, and to learn. And Eamon, of course, will assist us to do that in his own entertaining and informative way this evening. However, we can relive the events of 1921 and since, 
or we can recognize the better place that we are now in and work to find our way through all of the outstanding problems and the issues that face us in the future. And in that way, the decade of centenaries has posed a challenge to all of us, but it's entirely fitting that we can come together tonight from across these islands, British, Irish and others, to reflect on events which have had a significant impact upon us all. It would be remiss of me, given the day that's in it, following the statement from Arlene Foster, our First Minister. So I want to personally wish Arlene and her family the very best for the future, and indeed all of those involved in that particular process, the best of luck in the time ahead. I want at this point to move to our special guest this evening, beginning with the Right Honourable Sir Lindsay Hoyle, MP, Speaker of the House of Commons. The speakers and the presiding officers from Westminster, Edinburgh, Cardiff, and Belfast meet ordinarily every six months. And it was just over a year ago that Sir Lindsay and I met with our counterparts in Edinburgh a week before the impact of COVID-19 actually started to hit. We ended that meeting agreeing that I would hold the next meeting of that group in Belfast and once restrictions allow, I'm looking forward to hosting Sir Lindsay here at Stormont in person. However, I'm delighted that Lindsay is able to join us tonight and I really welcome the significance of the Speaker of the House of Commons joining the launch of our centenary programme tonight. Sir Lindsay, I want to thank you for joining us and I now ask you to address our event this evening. Thank you, Sir Lindsay. Alex, please call me Lindsay. It's much more comfortable for me. Can I just say, Mr Speaker, it really is a privilege to be invited with you. As Speaker of Northern Ireland Assembly, 100 years of history, and people have different views and opinions of that history, but the history is there. And to be able to listen and to take part in what I believe is a very, very important part of that history is tonight looking back on that. But of course, you were so kind to me as a new speaker meeting you and welcome, as you said, to Northern Ireland. And I've got to be quite honest. I've got to say that this is important. It's important even though we may be on team, that, as you say, Westminster's represents Northern Ireland, the Republic of Ireland, Common Caller is there, and I just want to be part of this. But what I would say is that when you invited me, there is a gap in my life. I have never been to Northern Ireland. I was so looking forward to coming, Alex, as you well know. It was an exciting period for me to be able to come out to look and to get a better understanding for Northern Ireland. Because in the end, I was a speaker that was elected as an MP back in 1997. And I was part of that history that was made, part of that peace process. That when I came in, way back then, it was about the Prime Minister, it was about the Republic of Ireland, the President of America coming together to bring peace. And I was part of that and it always will remain with me. It was made such a difference to get a real understanding as an MP, a newly elected MP, to actually see the peace agreement, the Gulf Faraday agreement and the Belfast agreement that came through the Northern Ireland Assembly that was founded in 1998. The decommissioning that followed, the IRA, IRA declared an end to its campaign. And that was peace and history that was made. So what I would say is that we look at 100 years, but at least I can say I have seen peace, I've seen people coming together. It is not just about tolerance, it's about respect that we've got for each other. It's that respect and shared values that we can bring together to go forward. And I think it's so important. And as I say, it is an absolute privilege for you to invite me to be part of this history tonight. And I've got to say, with Cohen, myself, Alex, I want to thank you for the difference that you have made and the warm welcome that you always give. And it's so important. Northern Ireland is something that we will work and be part of. And the Republic of Ireland is part of of this history. As we look back at the 100 years, views may vary. You can't change history. But we, what we can do is look to where we've got to now. And I think it's so important. So can I just say, thank you for what you've done. Thank you for the way that you welcomed me and making me feel part of Northern Ireland. 
with the warm welcome that you've always given to me. I've got to say, big thank you to everybody and everybody who's taking part. I'm really looking forward to hearing the lecture tonight that will be, that will educate me even farther. As much as that, what I might know, I know I'm going to be given even further information about 100 years of history. Once again, thanks, Alex. Okay, Lindsay, thank you very, very much. Thank you for your very warm and encouraging remarks. And uh, we certainly will extend a very warm welcome uh, to yourself, Lindsay, a very strong Cade Mila Falcha, as soon as the restrictions allow that. So thank you again very much for your, your contribution so far. And I want to turn to Dublin and to welcome the, the Concurla of Dáil Oran, Sean O'Farrell. Sean has been a very keen supporter, indeed, you would say a partner of these events in the past. And we've also been working very closely together as we try to get the North-South Interparliamentary Association established between the Dáil and the Assembly. And I look forward to Sean hosting myself and Assembly colleagues later this year. Sean, again, once again, you're very, very welcome indeed. And I would ask you now to make a, a few remarks. Thank you, Sean Gormagat. The marvels of modern technology. Um, I have to admit to my colleagues here in the office on a regular basis that I'm afraid I'm a Luddite when it comes to these matters. But um, fellow speakers, parliamentary colleagues and friends, uh, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, really is a pleasure to join you this evening. And I thank Alex for the invitation. I was <laughs> Uh, I, I grew. I, I want to compliment Robin and his team for organising the complicated logistics. And I must say that it's a real cause of regret that we cannot meet in person this evening uh, in Stormont because I have yet to have the pleasure of meeting Sir Lindsay. And I look forward to the chairs of Stormont, the House of Commons and Leinster House meeting together once these dark clouds uh, have lifted. And in fact, I'd uh, be happy to host such a gathering. This past year has seen us try to find imaginative solutions to continue our parliamentary business in the era of COVID-19. And for our part in the Houses of the Oireachtas, we've been able to continue our legislative and parliamentary oversight roles, albeit in a somewhat restricted manner. And it is essential that that business continues. One important aspect of that parliamentary business is the ongoing commemoration of this decade of centenaries. And this evening's lecture is a valuable contribution to that debate. I know from personal experience of Eamon's previous lectures that we can look forward to a stimulating, intelligent and fair assessment of the political birth pangs of a century ago. He is a superb communicator and a great and has a great gift for clarity of expression. In fact, I've heard Eamon so often uh, and enjoyed his uh, contributions so much that I could maybe perhaps now describe myself as a student of Eamon Phoenix. But uh, in view of the very complicated timetables involved in the moulding of nation states on our shared islands before and after the Great War, such clarity is a real challenge for any historian. What Eamon discusses uh, this evening is now our shared history. But at the time, it was a dangerous, life-changing series of events, bereft of the safety net of hindsight. And such are the joys and challenges of history. So we look forward to a lecture on a relatively broad sweep of Irish history from 1912 to 1925. And I'd like to consider the historical events of a century ago, specifically in 1921. Ireland was at war and was soon to be at war with itself. And all civil wars leave bitter memories. The civil war period in Ireland was no different and will prove a challenging commemoration. So I can call it um, muted there again. Apologies for this. Um, the civil war period in Ireland was no different and will prove a challenging commemoration for us over the coming months. In early June 21, the newly established Northern Ireland Parliament sat for the first time initially in Belfast City Hall, subsequently in the Union Theological College, before sitting from 32 uh, in Stormont. Last, later that month, in June 21, uh, King George formally opened the Northern Ireland Parliament. Nationalist MPs did not attend. The Dáil continued to sit in Dublin. And in late June, four Unionist MPs sat at the only meeting of the Southern Ireland House of Commons, as was required under the Anglo-Irish Treaty. 
It was a complicated time to be a politician, for sure. And it was a time for deeply divided loyalties and entrenched viewpoints, some of which prevail to this day. But as has been said, respectful political discourse was in short supply. And sadly, the stage was set for many decades of resentment, of anger, fear and suspicion on all sides of the Irish and British political spectrum. The very act of political partitioning of shared geographical space could only have serious repercussions for all those living in that shared space. So more recent times have shown that mutual respect and reconciliation can only come through recognition, understanding and knowledge. Uh, for example, for those of a nationalist world view, the royal visit to Belfast in June 1921 must be acknowledged and respected as an event of huge uh, importance to the unionist community in the period under discussion this evening. I still consider the visit of King George's granddaughter to Dublin, Cork and my own county of Kildare in 2011 as one of the key events in my lifetime. The warm recognition deservedly given to Queen Elizabeth and the Duke of Edinburgh a decade ago showed that while the past could not be changed or reimagined, it was possible to recalibrate our present to create a potentially better future. On the other hand, those of a unionist worldview should be invited to acknowledge that there were aspects of the new administration in Belfast 100 years ago, which failed to respect and acknowledge aspirations and political hopes of a large section of the population under the new parliament's jurisdiction. Dark days for many lay ahead for nationalists in certain areas of Northern Ireland, for unionists on the border region between the two nascent states, as just two examples. This needs to be acknowledged. Gatherings such as this allow for a respectful, mature reflection and debate on key issues in our shared history. The more we know, understand and appreciate that shared history, the more we know ourselves and those living with us. And one final reflection, if I might. Never has the role of education been more important. Sadly, it would seem that the study of history now seems to be on the wane. In the, area of social, in the era of social media and 280 letter tweets, we're communicating more, but surely listening much less. That impacts on our understanding of ourselves and those around us. The events Eamon discusses this evening are complicated and complex, but they impacted on our forebears a century ago, and the ripples of that disruptive and disrupting narrative are still felt today. So we should take pride in who we are and what we have become. But we should use the tools of history, factual understanding and healthy, respectful debate to educate ourselves and those who come after us to understand and to appreciate the many threads that create the broader tapestry of our shared experience on these shared islands. Again, Alex, my sincere thanks to you for the invitation to join you this evening. And I look forward to a stimulating talk and engagement uh, thereafter. Sorry about that, Tarun Arm. As I said, Sean, yourself following on from Lindsay, it is important that we would continue to meet and to cooperate and to learn from each other. And uh, I think it's essential actually that we would continue to do that, to show leadership by building strong relationships amongst yourselves and very pragmatic and practical issues of the day. Moving on to uh, our main feature, if you like, of the evening, uh, I spoke earlier about different perspectives on these centenaries, and I think it says much for the reputation of Dr. Eamon Phoenix, that all parties regard him as a trusted pair of hands to deal with these issues, not only because of the depth of his knowledge, but also because of his ability to tell the stories. For the next few months, Eamon is in heavy demand, and we are privileged to have secured him here at the Assembly to deliver the series of four lectures over the next few weeks covering the Unionist perspective, the nicest Republican's perspective, and the old Stormont Parliament. However, he begins tonight with an overview, and I also want to welcome Anne Donnelly of NI Screen. Those of you who are present at our last lecture will be aware of how the partnership between Anne and NI Screen has brought these issues further to life with the use of archive footage, and I hope you enjoy that tonight. So after Eamon's lecture, we will open the floor up for a short period of questions and comments to Eamon. 
If during the lecture you want to enter any questions in the chat box, we will take a note and try to cover some of those or as many of those as possible. So without any further delay, Eamon, can I say that the floor is all of yours. You're very welcome this evening. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Speaker, uh, distinguished guests, Ladies and gentlemen, delighted to be uh, speaking tonight about the centenary of the partition of Ireland, the creation of Northern Ireland, and indeed the Anglo-Irish Treaty of 1921 and what followed. Um, so I want to bring you right back to the beginning of the process um, through a, a, a newsreel film of Belfast from a tramcar around 1905, just as the new city hall, a symbol of the great industrial city that Belfast was, was actually a building uh, in Donegal Square in the centre of the city. This is Belfast, Ireland's only industrial city at the start of the 20th century. This is British-governed Ireland under the under the rule of Dublin Castle, Ireland governed under the British Crown, as it had been really since the Act of Union of 1801, which abolished the old Irish Parliament. It's a city in a province associated with a, an industrial revolution, really, from the middle of the 19th century onwards. Belfast is resting on a tripod of linen, shipbuilding, engineering. Just think about it, 35,000 men engaged before the First World War in the great shipyard of Harland and Wolfe. There was the wee yard as well. And here you have the city hall surrounded by hoarding. It's not quite ready yet. The awnings of Robinson Cleavers, known as the Irish Linen Warehouse. This was a city which was the fastest growing city in the United Kingdom or Ireland in the course of the 19th century. Belfast grew from, what, 20,000 people in 1800 to 350,000 in 1901, drawing people really from the nine counties of Ulster and further afield, as skilled workers from Scotland, workers from the whole northern half of Ireland, a city which really um, was the shock city of Ulster's Industrial Revolution. These are the horse trams about to be replaced by new electric trams uh, as we head down the new Royal Avenue, which was a grand kind of streetscape cutting through previous slums in the centre of the town. And the City Hall was meant to symbolise Belfast's coming of age. But of course, this was a city of momentum, even in 1905. That year saw the birth of the Ulster Unionist Council by a new professional class of unionists, men like James Craig and his brother Charles, really seizing control of unionism from the dead hand of the gentry who had dominated it for so long. The gentry were still there, the Brooks and the O'Neills, but they had their place now rather than more dominant. In the same city, in those Edwardian years, you had the first stirrings of militant republicanism, as men like Dennis McCullough, uh, Ernest Blythe from a, a Protestant farming background in County Antrim, and others began to try to regenerate the Irish Republican Brotherhood through the Dungannon clubs. They recruited a young tram driver from the West of Ireland called Sean McDermott or Sean McDermott. And of course, those young Turks would become, of course, the uh, new members of the IRB, uh, meeting with old Tom Clark, uh, born or brought up in Dungannon in Dublin in the years before the First World War, planning a rising uh, when England's difficulty, as they saw it, became Ireland's opportunity. But yet, you had this soaraway city. We're going to bring you now, really, to a scene, really, at Dulwich in London, around 1911, 1912. This is a London borough, represented, we discovered in a recent Zoom, to the British Irish parliamentary uh, tier, um, which is in a conservative constituency. And here we can see some key figures in the developing Ulster Unionist movement against Home Rule, along with their British Tory allies, just freezing it there, and on the left you can see a fairly youthful James Craig, born into a wealthy distilling family, unusually for a Presbyterian, his father was a distiller, living in a grand Victorian mansion overlooking Belfast Lock called Craig Avon, uh, with his lady wife, he'd married into the London mercantile classes, and here you have Edward Carson, the quintessential all-Ireland Unionist, a man whose roots lay in professional Dublin. His father was an architect, but his mother was from the Anglo-Irish landed gentry from County Galway, outside the town of Athenry. He'd spent his childhood holidays there at their family seat, Castle Ellen, with the butler and the retinue of servants. And it was from his mother 
Isabella Lambert, that Edward Carson really gained really his worldview, his support for the Union, his cherishing of the empire, and his defense of the landed interest at a time when the landed classes, of course, were under pressure from the conservative land acts introduced, which enabled Ireland to become a country of, te of, of um, um, tenant proprietors. Um, by the 1930s, north and south, as the tenants were unable to buy their own land. But this is the Ulster Unionists beginning to forge the old alliance with British conservatism. Let's just see it flowing on here on Dulwich Common in 1911. And we can see, of course, the, the serried ranks of the Unionists and their friends, because, of course, Ulster was now in the frame. So the British Conservative Party, Ireland was the key to the British Empire. The campaign for home rule from the 1870s onwards, uh, championed by Parnell in the 1880s and 90s, and now by John Redmond, uh, was obviously demanding uh, an all-Ireland parliament with limited powers of self-government. Within the UK, admittedly, this was home rule, not a republic. And here we can see Austin Chamberlain. The man in the top hat is the former Conservative Prime Minister, Arthur Balfour. And of course, this brings us back to 1885, when Mr Gladstone, the Liberal Prime Minister, had converted to home rule and had tried to introduce two home rule bills, both defeated. Nonetheless, the Tories became the party, not just of empire, but of Protestants in danger as the Ulster Unionists from the 1880s claimed that not only was Home Rule Rome Rule, which would install, if you like, a Catholic ascendancy to replace the old, but that indeed Home Rule would militate against the prosperity of the lagan and the ban where uh, the, the wheels of industry had been turning since the late Victorian era. And you notice the slogan there, Dulwich supports Ulster. These men and others are going to be very much the uh, conservative supporters. With Bono Law, a man of strong Ulster Presbyterian roots, they would, of course, champion the cause of the Union with Carson and Craig in the years to come. We're about to move now to, I think, Craig, well, let's see what we're about to move to, but I suspect it may be Craig Avonhouse, um, the residence of James Craig, now under threat, by the way. If anyone has a way of preserving Craig Avon, which is actually falling into ruin, they might use their influence politically. But here we have Craig Avonhouse, where we're going to see Carson introduced to his adopted people, on whose um, minds he was to play like a virtuoso in these years, uh, 1910 to 1921, Carson's decade-long association with the Ulster Unionist cause. Um, and of course, Craig Avon became the kind of nerve center for Ulster Unionist resistance uh, during this period. And uh, uh, indeed, we can see that this actually we've moved to Larne, and this is the Larne gun running of the uh, 23rd, 24th of April, uh, 1914, when Carson's army, the Ulster Volunteers, raised to oppose Home Rule, the first private army in Ireland, really, since the 18th century. And this is them, of course. Um, they, of course, ran guns into Larne, the famous gun-running episode involving uh, Major Fred Crawford, a Belfast businessman, with the consent of Carson. Of course, they bring in 35,000 German rifles. We have to remember that Germany was soon to be the United Kingdom's mortal enemy in a great war that was beginning to loom on the horizon. You had the Great Alliance systems from the 1890s. You had the naval race between Britain and the Kaiser's Germany. So to import these guns to an illegal army, the UVF, was, of course, highly illegal. And, of course, this brings us back to the Liberal government of this period, headed by Herbert Henry Asquith. Don't know if we have a, a picture of Asquith. Oh, here with Carson. Let this roll for a minute. And Carson, of course, receiving the colours. The um, thing about Carson was, of course, he wasn't only a staunch unionist. He was a very eminent lawyer. And he used all his forensic skill and his previous cabinet and indeed um, his his influence and connections to assist the unionist cause at this time. This is the time when unionists have friends in high places, in the Tory establishment, in the uh, upper ranks of the British military, people like, for example, Lord Kitchener were sympathetic to the Unionist cause. People like the Anglo-Irish um, big house figure Field Marshal Sir Henry Wilson, uh, Chief of the Imperial General Staff during the First World War, and of course, later James Craig's military advisor at the inception of the Northern Ireland government. But Carson isn't quite, you know, the erect if you like, uh, altogether figure that we see here. Carson was a man of moods. Um, 
his, his biographers tell us he suffered from neurotic anxiety because uh, from childhood. And therefore, um, he would make these commanding speeches on the public platform. Ulster will fight. Ulster will be right. Um, he would talk about the nefarious home rule sch scheme, uh, which was a threat to uh, a free people. And then, of course, he would dissolve into one of these deep depressions, what Churchill called the black dog. Uh, this worried uh, Craig and his unionist colleagues for a while, but eventually they realized he would keep taking the tablets and eventually make a return. But remember, Edward Carson's um, agenda was different to that of James Craig. When James Craig was returned to Parliament in 1906, a bad year for unionism, because of course it saw the liberal lands landslide. Think back to Tony Blair's landslide for New Labour in 1997, and you get the picture. The Tories were a sort of a, a divided uh, minority, um, you know, uh, thinking about changing their leaders every year. And it's in this scenario that uh, Edward Carson the lawyer with the Dublin accent becomes all important in articulating the unionist cause against Tom Rule. He told Craig he wasn't in for a game of bluff, but his aim was different to Craig's. He wanted to save the island he knew and loved as um, a native of Dublin with his roots in the landed gentry of Galway, who had been educated at a Church of Ireland public school in modern County Leash, um, uh, the, the, the famous Arlington public school at Port Arlington, and of course then Trinity College Dublin, Four Courts, all of that. He had been a liberal before Rome Rule. Edward Carson, uh, and he wanted to, of course, retain the whole of Ireland in the folds of the Union Jack. He saw Ulster as a weapon which would block the way to John Redmond's um, project, Home Rule for the Whole Island. On the other hand, his deputy, James Craig, was, as one sketch writer described him at this time, signally uncharismatic. Actually, I'm quoting Jonathan Barden, the late Jonathan Barden, historian of the province of Ulster. Um, the uh, sort of uh, punch sketch writer in 1906, as Craig took a seat, and there he is on, his, uh, on the left there, outside his grand home at Craig Avon um, in East Belfast. Uh, the sketch writer said um, he talked about the brogued captain and his dreary drip of words. And this is true. Craig was uncharismatic, but he was a brilliant black room organizer. And of course, he was the perfect foil to the charismatic Carson. And it takes an able leader to see his own defects. And he realized he didn't have the charisma, but he had the organizational flair. And Carson was the, the front of house man during this partnership. The third man was really Andrew Bono Law, the son of a Coleraine Presbyterian minister born in Canada, um, an iron master in Scotland, who actually fought off the Ulster Unionist cause almost as a personal mission. But of course, in endorsing the UVF, in endorsing the threat to use force against an act of parliament, um, the uh, Third Home Rule Bill of 1912, um, historians have seen Bono Law as straining the bonds of the British constitution, because parliament, of course, as we know only too well in this country, is an alternative to civil war. But if the opposition don't accept the legitimacy of the government or its policy, then you're into difficulties. These are tense years. Um, everyone knew that the argument would be won by the uh, Liberals and the Irish Nationalists on the floor of the House of Commons, and the power of the House of Lords to veto it had been broken. So the real pressures were going to be extra parliamentary. And this is Bono Law with uh, the unknown prime minister, because by the time he uh, reached the top of the greasy pole in 1922, he was dying of cancer of the throat, was only there a few months. But he's a critical figure in this period. So in many ways, the Ulster Unionists are very lucky between 1912 in, and 1922 in their leadership and in the power of their allies, uh, as we'll see. We're going to move very, very quickly now, of course, to the uh, the First World War, because, of course, the First World War defines very much that decade. Um, and it's during the First World War we have the word blood sacrifice beginning to creep in to the um, uh, Irish agenda, both nationalist and unionist. Um, on the eve of the First World War, of course, Ireland was in the brink of civil war. Attempts to find a resolution to the Home Rule crisis uh, failed. Uh, Lloyd George introduced county option in 1914, the spring of 1914, allowing individual Ulster counties to seek a plebiscite to opt in or out of Home Rule. That would allow at least four Ulster counties with Protestant majorities to remain under the Union Jack. Nobody was talking about a devolved government storm. 
at this time, offer menus a day afterwards. On the other hand, Bonolot told Carson in 1914, it would be unrealistic to demand a six-county split because for Manor, Tyrone, and of course the maiden city of Derry throughout Londonderry, all by this stage had nationalist majorities, small in the case of the two counties, the pivot counties. Derry would have been sitting around 55, 56% and had returned by a narrow margin a pro-home rule MP um, in uh, 1912. So we can see that unionism wasn't expecting a huge acreage, but the covenant, the UVF, were organised across the nine counties of Ulster. We have to talk about this because it was Sir Dennis Henry, uh, one of the few eminent Catholic Unionists, a leading lawyer, and of course, First Lord Chief Justice of Northern Ireland, the only uh, Ulster Catholic to become a Unionist MP. It was Dennis Henry from Draperstown, Mid-Ulster, who famously said at the election court in Oma in 1918 that in the north of Ireland, as he put it, we can assume that Catholic means nationalist or Republican and Protestant means unionist. And everybody agreed and the court proceeded on that basis. Now that might be disputed today, but that's why that's the basis on which unionist and nationalist proceeded as they sort of, uh, if you uh, probe the demographics during this critical decade running up to the partition of Ireland. Let's take, of course, uh, that civil war could have broken out in 1914. Both sides were gearing up. And here I have to say something else. We've seen the UVF, but of course, Carson had, as one historian put it many years ago, reignited the Fenian flame of violent revolutionary nationalism, which had, of course, been prominent in 1798, 1848, and in the Fenian rising of 1867. But since the 1870s, Irish nationalism had supported moderate home rule now being championed by John Redmond, a supporter of the House of Commons, very much a House of Commons man. Redmond had started his career as a young lawyer, as a clerk in the House of Commons, one of those rigged figures that some of our MPs in the audience are, are very, very um, uh, uh, sort of uh, conscious of. And of course, uh, he believed that uh, the British Parliament was the zenith of democracy. He also wanted to reconcile East and West, Britain and Ireland, and North and South. That was Redmond's great mission, and prove that Home Rule could work for the two traditions in Ireland. Nobody spoke, to, spoke about the two traditions, and there was a, an exaggerated nationalist perception that there was a large underbelly of Protestant liberal Home Rule support, particularly in rural Ulster. Now, within the north of Ireland, there were areas like the Root and Ballymoney, parts of North Don, North Tyrone around Dunham Manor, where the old 1798 spirit lingered on. And you did have perhaps a few thousand Protestant home rulers, but certainly the urban proletariat, highly politicised since the first Home Rule Bill of 1886, were heavily mobilised in the Ulster Covenant movement in the UVF. But coming back to my central point about Carson reigniting the Fenian flame, of course, Carson inspired the birth of a nationalist counter-army, the Irish Volunteers. It was Owen McNeill, a Gaelic scholar from the Glens of Antrim, uh, who wrote an article in 1913 called The North Began. And McNeill from Glenarm praised Carson and the UVF. He said these armed men, parading against Home Rule, had taken the first real step towards Irish independence. Now, to many, that seemed ridiculous. But what he meant was they had, as one IRB figure put it, they had... Uh, opened a revolutionary door. And of course, as the Irish volunteers emerged, taken over by Redmond in 1914 to place them in safekeeping, they became 200,000 to the UVF's 90,000 in the north. And Ireland was really on the brink of civil war, though the UVF was by far the best armed as a result of Lan in 1914. But of course, the civil war that might have broken out in August 1914, as the peace conference failed at Buckingham Palace, that civil war was averted by, of course, um, the assassination of the Austrian Archduke Franz Ferdinand in far off Sarajevo. And soon the alliance systems cranked into place. And Carson and Redmond, shaking hands on the House of Commons uh, in memory of their old days in the four courts, they urged their volunteers, north and south, to support the British war effort. Uh, Carson talked about defending Ulster and the Empire. Redmond, the nationalist, talked about Ireland and the freedom of small nations. And something like 200,000 uh, Irishmen from North and South, from the two traditions, would fight in the First World War, and at least 40,000 
would die in the carnage on the Western Front. Let's just go and hear the voice of one of the leaders of the UVF, Carson's army, which became the 36th Ulster Division, recalling the Battle of the Somme in the mid-1960s. This is, of course, Sir Norman Strong, a later speaker of the Northern Ireland Parliament, who was murdered, of course, uh, in his estate at Tynan in 1981. And we're about to hear the voice of Norman Strong recalling the events at the Battle of the Somme, just for a few moments. So really, the Battle of the Somme, in which the Ulster Division lost 5,000 men, 5,000 casualties on the first day. It became unionism, blood sacrifice. Young men from the Shankill, from the townlands of Mid-Ulster, from the Lagan and Donegal, they died, you know, in their thousands at the Somme. Carson made a speech a couple of weeks later in Belfast, which got very little publicity, but struck me looking through the newspapers. He said, from his unionist perspective, of course, that home rule was killed and buried on the battlefield of the Somme. What we, we, we can interpret from that is that he believed there would have to be a quid pro quo. The British government after the war would have to reciprocate to the losses of Protestant Ulster in, if you like, excluding them from whatever uh, home rule settlement, uh, uh, if you like, was established in the rest of Ireland. But of course, many, many nationalists, thousands of nationalists joined the Connacht Rangers, even from West Belfast, the Munster Fusiliers. And of course, we have an amazing scene here from Armagh Catholic Cathedral. Um, during the First World War, this is actually uh, from 1917, and we see Cardinal Logue, who was an Irish speaker from Donegal, who had presided over the uh, Roman Catholic Church in Ireland from the late 19th century to partition. And here we have him greeting uh, the serried ranks of several thousand men uh, who are um, Catholics of Irish descent in the Royal Canadian Irish Rangers. This is the officers at Ada Celi and Armagh with the aged Cardinal Logue. He always looked like an old woman. Irish was his first language. And of course, we see the officers and we'll see the men in a minute, if you like, funneling into the church for high mass. Because of course, that this would happen uh, in Armagh, um, uh, you know, if you like, facilitated by the Catholic Church is a reminder of the massive support in Nationalist Ireland for the British war effort, uh, until certainly the 1916 Rising, when recruitment began to tail off. Uh, the police re record, you know, in their reports from places like Lisburn and uh, uh, Dungannon, how orange and green bands accompanied the recruits to the uh, armed forces as they entrain uh, for um, the camps before they go to the Western Front at this time. So it's actually footage that's quite amazing today when you look back in this. I mean, uh, and of course, we're glad today, of course, in the light of the, the ceasefires and the peace process, that Nationalist Ireland, of course, has remembered its war dead and that everyone on this island, north and, north, north and south, unionist and national, is aware that people of all traditions uh, fought and died in the First World War. So, uh, of course, there was another blood sacrifice that was equally defining and more defining in terms of nationalist Ireland, and that is, of course, the Easter Rising of 1916. Its views, of course, went back uh, into uh, Wolf Tone's republicanism, the United Irishman at the, la at the end of the 19th century, the failure of Redmond, I suppose, to achieve home rule. The bill was placed on the statute book, was, but was suspended and was overshadowed by the dark pall of partition, as nationalists would have seen it from 1914. And we're going to see some footage now from the Easter Rising. Um, an amazing scene that Dublin was held for a week by, you know, um, what, uh, 1,500 armed men and women of the IRB, um, the uh, anti-war Irish volunteers, the Irish Citizen Army, come on them on. Pierce read the, the proclamation. And here you have what the British press called the fallen pride of stately Sackville Street. It was never O'Connell Street until 1924 because of a, a, an injunction taken by a previous viceroy to prevent it being named after the liberator. Daniel O'Connell. It was always called Sackville Street. These scenes were watched from the Gresham Hotel, by the way, by an Ulster volunteer from East Belfast, a teacher called James Mitchell, whose diary is a masterpiece of the rising. Very, very impartial as he watched the rising unfold, looking across at rebel headquarters. But the key thing about this was the execution of Pierce, Connolly and their comrades. Lady Fingal, who lived in a castle in County Meath, who was a friend of the Londonderries of Mount Stuart, 
she wrote in her diary about the executions after, if you like, um, perfunctory of court martials uh, at Richmond Barracks, carried out in the Stonebreakers' Yard of Kilmaino Jail in the early days of May 1916. Lady Fingal wrote, speaking for a lot of Irish nationalists, it was like watching blood oozing from under a closed door. Nationalist opinion was transformed from moderate home rule, really, to a demand for a much greater form of Irish self-determination, which, for which, of course, uh, the slogan, an Irish republic was used. And from these ruins, a new phoenix arose, not myself, but a new party called Sinn Féin, not the, the original party of 1905, which had failed and was a monarchist party, a new republican party, with Eamon de Valera, the senior surviving commandant, as its commander. Now the war, of course, comes to an end uh, with the armistice of the 11th of November 19, um, 1918. And the Irish question had been more or less kicked into touch for the war. It was a pretty cooperative feeling. There were branches of the Queen Mary Guild on the Falls and Shanker Roads, in the Waterside and the Bogside and Derry Stroke London Derry, as, you know, the middle classes gathered comfort for the men at the front. But that was to be shattered very, very quickly by a, a changing, if you like, political atmosphere in Ireland after the rising. Of course, an election followed the war, the first election since 1910. Sinn Féin contested every constituency. And of course, they swept the polls in Nationalist Ireland with 73 seats. The old Home Rule Party of John Redmond and Joe Devlin, the Northern Nationalist leader, just collapsed, really. It collapsed. It had atrophied during the war. It had been tarred with the brush of partition, having considered a six-county split in 1916. And now, of course, it's overtaken by this Republican movement with its new leaders, Eamon de Valera, Michael Collins, Arthur Griffith, Countess Markovic. This is D-Day for, for, for Edward Carson as well. As he migrated from his traditional base uh, in, the, in, 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 in the dreaming spires of Trinity for what the province of Trinity called a slum constituency in Belfast. He moves to Belfast, Don Cairn, and North Belfast, almost a recognition implicitly by Carson that partition, which he had never sought, was now almost inevitable. Um, and we move now, I think, to see the events of January 1919 as an Irish Republican Assembly meets in the Mansion House in Dublin. It tells us a lot about this time. Demobbed soldiers had held a meeting there in the morning and in the afternoon. The first session of Doyle Aaron, the first Doyle was held in the beautiful building built by the Dawson family of Castle Dawson in Mid Ulster. This was the ancestral home of former Prime Minister uh, James Chichester Clark, and Dawson Street's called after him. And of course, we can see that a republic is now in the air in the south. Um, there had been a pact in the north, enabling the Home Rule Party to hold on to a handful of seats. And led by Joe Devlin, they were the only nationalist presence in the House of Commons. Here are men of the Royal Irish Constabulary, a mainly Catholic force, which would fall victim, of course, to the War of Independence and a War of Attrition by the IRA. Here's on Don Aaron. It really means the Assembly of Ireland. This is the Doyle taken at a later stage in April 1919. It did a number of things. It declared a republic. It set up a cabinet. And, of course, it adopted a policy of abstention from Westminster, described as the Hall of the Conqueror, a policy which the present Sinn Féin party still adopts. Now, of course, this created opportunities for unionism. You have a, a, a shift in the balance of power at Westminster as well as in Ireland, from Irish nationalism to Austrianism. The, the redistribution of 1918 had assisted unionism in the north. Uh, instead of having three seats in Belfast, they now had 10 seats in Belfast. Um, unionism had been strengthened by the war and the um, prioritization of urban areas in the, if you like, redistribution of seats. And so Carson and Craig are leading a unionist bloc within the conservative bloc at Westminster. There's a coalition government, as there had been before the war, led by Lord George, but dominated by the Conservatives. The Tories have a stronger hold on Irish policy. And that enables, of course, James Craig and two of his colleagues to assume positions as junior ministers between 1919 and 21. So this gives uh, Captain James Craig um, a lot of contacts in the corridors of power. And he's able to shape the Irish settlement to suit the demands and indeed aspirations of his 
unionist people. Craig had always thought in terms of a homeland for his own people in the north in the event of home rule. Of course, Devlin becomes the member for Ireland, and he is the main critic of the British government's policy of militarism and reprisals, and of course, the major critic of partition in these years. On the same day that the Doyle met, the 21st of January 1919, the first, sh the first shots rang out in what was to escalate into an Irish war of independence. We used to talk in my day at Queen's about the Anglo-Irish War, but now I think the term the Irish War of Independence is general. It spread across the country, involving those volunteers who hadn't been involved in the rising of the provinces, reorganised as the divisions of the IRA. And it's a group of men led by this man, Dan Breen, a railway worker. County Tipperary, Seamus Robinson, a Belfast IRA man, they, if you like, ambushed two policemen escorting a load of jelly knight at Solohead Bay Crossroads. Uh, this isn't authorised by the Doyle, but this is often seen as the beginning of the War of Independence. And of course, Lloyd George's reaction, it vacillates between, uh, if you like, coercion and attempts at conciliation over the next two years. Lloyd George is mindful of American opinion, of British liberal opinion. He doesn't want to create more martyrs. Um, yet, of course, uh, he is in the end, he suppresses Doyle Aaron at the end of 1919. And the Doyle cabinet, with him and de Valera as his president, Michael Collins as minister of finance, becomes a government on the run. It does establish its own court structure, especially in the, uh, you know, behind the charred line of police barracks across the south and west by 1920. Having said, you don't declare war on rebels, uh, you rely on the police. Lord George is forced as the RIC collapses, really under the strain of the war, under the strain of a boycott by the uh, nationalist population over much of Southern Ireland. He brings in, of course, auxiliary forces, the Black and Tans, untrained, ill-disciplined ex-soldiers, and the auxiliaries, fearless, um, elite force of ex-officers. And they become involved under emergency legislation in 1920. And of course, Ireland is in a state of war. But remember, Lloyd George and Critical members of his cabinet are involved at this stage at the Versailles Conference, redrawing the map of Europe. Three empires have collapsed. New nation states are arising, like Poland, like Czechoslovakia. Sinn Féin had wanted a seat at that conference, but President Woodrow Wilson of America is not prepared to endanger his special relationship with the United Kingdom, forged in the war by demanding a seat as of right for Ireland, which is really part of the UK at this stage. Dublin Castle is still operating. All Ireland courts are still operating. That doesn't change until 1921. So that's what's happening on the ground. Now, behind the scenes, other things are happening. James Craig, of course, is able to use his influence his pivotal, his pivotal position, sure-footed in the corridors of power, if you like, to shape the settlement that is now in train. The Long Committee is established in October 1921 under a former um, Chief Secretary for Ireland and Conservative MP called Walter Long. This is a coalition government. So within that committee, within Parliament, you have Liberals and Tories who were at daggers drawn a few years earlier on the Irish question. Uh, when more than epithets were hurled across the House of Commons. So the upshot is during this period, of course, um, the Long Committee is deliberating. It has to you know, decide several questions. Will it give home rule to all Ireland? Will there be county option for the North? Or will it be two Irish states? And they, uh, they, they consider very quickly and they, they determine that Ireland will be partitioned. Remember, these are two home rule parliaments we're talking about. This would be a very soft line on the map, like the present line between England and Scotland. And of course, um, just freezing it there for a moment, Dan, uh, of course, they, they decide on partition. The question then is, what acreage will Northern Ireland be? Will it be the historic province of the Covenant, uh, an area more... Um, easy to defend in the House of Commons than a truncated province? Uh, or will it be the six counties, which Carson and Redmond had agreed, though under very different illusions in 1916? Redmond thought it would be a temporary um, exclusion scheme. Carson had guarantees it would be permanent. Would it, so the, the real issue, would it be nine counties or six? Well, they decided in favour of six counties because they felt, of nine counties initially, the whole province, because they felt that, you know, 
with a large Catholic minority of about 44%, um, this would be the quickest way to achieve a united Ireland, which was seen to be in Britain's national interest. It was James Craig, though, who intervened very, very famously in November 1921. And this speaks volumes for his key position as the link man between the Ulster Unionist Council and what was happening, really, at Westminster. And we have in the minutes of the Long Committee that on the 13th of, of November 1919, Craig intervened. He expressed himself, the minutes tell us, against the inclusion of the whole of Ulster in the Northern Parliament and thought six counties preferable. Now, this was a hammer blow to the 80,000 loyalists of Cavan, Monan and Donegal. If you think of the, the area of the Lagan, just west of Derry, which was overwhelmingly Protestant from the plantation. Big farms, very much involved in their council met in the Guildhall, London Derry number two council until 1921. They were part of what all people in the Lagan I know call Derry the city. Um, people will talk in Carrigan's today in Lifford about going to the city because it's always been their Mecca. It was the economic capital of Donegal. It was the railway center for Donegal. It was inextricably linked with its Donegal interlude. So, I mean, they were shocked. The Cavan Unionists under Lord Farnham were shocked. They had raised 5,000 Ulster volunteers. They had fought at the Somme as well. But Craig goes on. The reason given was that, and the minutes quote Craig, and this is a very, very blunt um, expression, Protestant representation would be strengthened. And he also thought that six counties would be a unit easier to govern than the whole province. So there we have the sectarian head count. Craig didn't want a province with a huge nationalist majority, which would militate against efficient government west of the ban and, you know, on the Donegal and Cavan borders. He didn't really want that. He wanted the six counties. Why did he not go for four? Because he was incorporating a Trojan horse. We have to remember back to the covenant. The covenant stated, signed by half a million Ulster Protestant men and women, that they would refuse to recognize the authority of an Irish parliament if it were created. And if it were imposed on them, they would fight. That was exactly the policy of the uh, Northern Nationalists against the new Northern Ireland uh, uh, Parliament and government. They took a leave from the Ulster Covenant. They would refuse to uh, recognise its authority. And some of them were prepared with the backing of uh, Sinn Féin in Dublin to fight. So it was exactly the same. So if Craig had gone for a smaller area, say four counties, as County Option had um, you know, kind of uh, uh, outlined in 1914, where Newry and uh, Derry, London Derry would be given separate plebiscites, then the Unionist majority would be something like 80%. It would have been an absolute sure bet to last almost forever. But in this sense, the Unionists were actually um, following the practice and they were exhibiting the kind of, um, if you like, characteristics of European nationalists, the Poles, you know, um, the, uh, the Czechs, who demanded buffer zones, more territory to which they were entitled. Now, to bring South Fermanagh, South Armagh, the bog side, into the new Northern Ireland, for which the inhabitants of those areas had absolutely no, if you like, um, feeling at all, would require um, major, major policing. And that's where, of course, a new force came into being, the Ulster Special Constabulary. Before I go there, I should say that the Long Committee insisted that the two Irish parliaments and those provisions for a home rule parliament in Dublin, it wasn't likely it would ever meet, given Sinn Féin's demand for a republic, but that these two parliaments would have a bond of union, a Council of Ireland linking them. And of course, that Council of Ireland would have control of minor matters, such as railways, fisheries, agricultural diseases, but it could in the words of the Long Committee, evolve into an all-Ireland parliament uh, on the basis of consent between North and South. James Craig was able to shape this bill. He didn't want the Council of Ireland. He wanted it very low powered, and really he achieved its elimination by 1925 with the consent of the Free State Government at that time. He didn't want PR, which was being imposed on the two Irish parliaments as a minority safeguard that had been brought in two years earlier by the British government to give Protestant say in Sligo a say in local government, and Catholics say in Ballymena, a say in local government. And it was working quite well. But Craig wanted to have the first past the post Westminster system, and he insisted on the right to abolish PR for uh, all elections after three years. Now, this was a minority safeguard, and this was bitterly resented by Devlin and the handful of nationalists in the House of Commons at that time. And of course, Craig was also very keen that his parliament should be established as, 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 as soon as possible. We saw an image there, maybe Anne will bring it by, of a man called, of course, Sir Ernest Clark. 
Um, uh, well, Sir Ernest Clarke, of course, was a, a high-ranking British civil servant um, who was brought in by Craig in the uh, autumn of 1920 as an additional undersecretary for Ireland. Uh, most undersecretaries were based in Dublin. Clarke was based in the City Hall in Belfast. His job was to draw up a blueprint for a new parliament and government of Northern Ireland. He's been described as Ulster's midwife. And, of course, he decided what departments would be set up, education, agriculture, home affairs covering policing and the electoral system. Um, he uh, was in charge of a number of appointed days. The old Ireland court system would have to be demolished. For example, um, nobody talked about Fermanagh and Tyrone uh, before 1914. It was Fermanagh and Monaghan. That was the assize unit based on the Diocese of Clotter. It was Armagh and Love. Um, uh, large parts of Cavan and Leitrim were administered from Inniskillen as poor law areas, you know. I talked about the two councils for um, uh, a meeting at the Guildhall, one for the urban area of Derry Stroke, London Derry, the other for, of course, East Donegal. And of course, the unionists in East Donegal were appalled when they heard that the appointed day was reached in May 1921, and they were going to be severed from the maiden city. Uh, they appealed it, but of course, a decision had been taken, was being implemented to carve out the six counties as a separate area. Clark's role was to, uh, if you like, raise the Ulster Specials, which reached 32,000 strong by 1920. This was an exclusively Protestant force, disguised at Westminster as special constabulary for Ireland. But it was really for the six counties, not even the whole of Ulster. It absorbed the survivors of the UVF from the Western Front, and really the uh, the urban and rural working classes uh, of the Protestant community. Um, you had the most important section with the B-Specials, part-time, ped and alarms, given a uniform and gun. They were allowed to bring their guns home. They become a major force. Now, by this stage, of course, the IRA campaign is spreading uh, across Ireland and beginning to impact in the north. We just go briefly to Cork City uh, in March 1920, because there is this kind of uh, axis running from Cork to Lisburn and Belfast in the summer of 1920. And we see how an event in the city of Cork, the assassination of the Sinn Féin Lord Mayor, was also an IRA figure, <coughs> by uniformed men who were found by a coroner's jury to be members of the Royal Irish Constabulary. Um, uh, the assassination of um, Thomas McCurtain, pictured here uh, in Cork, uh, was to lead, of course, to a coroner's verdict which named District Inspector Swansea uh, uh, a leading Ulsterman in the RIC in Cork. Swansea was then transferred to Lisburn. And of course, he was to be assassinated on Michael Collins's order on the 22nd of August, 1922. So these events in Cork City Hall, the massive propagandist funeral afterwards, this establishes that tradition of the Republican funeral, which of course um, is reflected down the years. Uh, Swansea is transferred secretly to Lisburn, still within the all Ireland jurisdiction of uh, uh, the Crown. But of course, he's tracked on. He, sh he is actually assassinated, leaving divine worship on a Sunday. Lisburn erupts, and we have the Lisburn pogrom. And if I could quote to you from Major Fred Crawford, who actually um, saw the burning town, the Catholic businesses had been uh, torched and the parochial house burned. He said, I took a dare up to Lisburn to see the state it was in. It reminded me of a French town after it had been bombarded by the Germans, as I saw in France in 1916. We visited the ruins of the priest's house on Chapel Hill. It was burnt or gutted. And, of course, he describes how Protestant businesses had accidentally caught fire because of um, the, um, uh, the burning of the premises of their Catholic neighbours and so on. Now, of course, this was to set a headline of political and sectarian violence that summer. The IRA were attacking barracks and Antrim and Don, taking their orders from GHQ in Dublin essentially Michael Collins, um, carrying out aspects of the intelligence war, um, assassinating two police witnesses, for example, in a Belfast hotel in uh, January 1921. Uh, they had been tracked from Dublin to give evidence in the court martial in Belfast. And then very, very serious violence in May, June 1921 in the city of Derry. Let's just move to Derry and give you a sense of what's happening there. 
And this is a, an amazing bit of footage it's called Civil War in Derry, a piece of a piece of, of, of newsreel footage which would have been watched in the maiden city at that time. Troops are sent up after something like 40 people have been killed in a trial of strength between the UVF, returned from the Great War, and the IRA, reinforced from Donegal. Very brutal sectarian killings. People are searched for religious items or membership of the Orange Order. Uh, the son of the head of the apprentice boys is shot dead in Donegal as he's approaching the city for work. A uh, number of Catholics are, 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 are shot dead, leaving a wake house. Uh, a British ship shells the city from the foil. This is a bloody civil war. It's triggered to some extent by the success of nationalism and capturing the Guildhall under PR in the 1920s and their gains. They control the county councils of Fermanagh and Tyrone and po Sinn Féin pose well across the north under PR. There's a fear within unionism too that some Somehow, uh, partition will be, if you like, undermined by um, a Sinn Féin thrust, as is happening west of the van. Then we move to Belfast, of course, the agony of Belfast, which is the story of Belfast that summer, as violence and tensions rise, um, nature abhors a vacuum, and everybody knows that Ireland is now in transition. Uh, there are fears that the Unionists will be betrayed by Lord George, that nationalists will be sold into a, um, a Carsonite state, all this kind of rhetoric of the time. We can see here, this is a Protestant working class area of um, North Belfast. Um, and we can see, you know, the kidney paver has been dug up and so on. But the key thing is, um, a speech by Edward Carson in Belfast saying, we will tolerate no Sinn Féin in Ulster. The assassination of an Ulster-born police commissioner in Cork, another one, Lieutenant General uh, G.B. Smith of Banbridge. And of course, the 12th holiday in the shipyards leads to a rise in tensions. And on the 23rd of um, June 1920, the shipyards reopen. And um, all the Catholic workers of the shipyards, engineering works, other firms are expelled from their work. And of course, something like 8,000 Catholics are expelled. And this is the beginning, really, of serious sectarian trouble in Belfast. A military picket here at the cooperative stores in York Street. This is the new University of Ulster uh, campus there near Frederick Street, near St. Anne's Cathedral. Ten young people are shot dead on their way to work there between the hours of 9 and 10.30 on a summer's morning in 1920. Agony sums it up, really. 450 people die violently. They're mostly innocent civilians. The key protagonists are, of course, the IRA and the Ulster Specials. They're also sectarian murder gangs. Uh, the fatalities break down 60% Catholic, 40% Protestant. The Protestant forces are, are, are the best armed. The Catholics are corralled in several areas. Catholics call it a pogrom. Unionists call it a siege. It leaves very deep scars. And you have the movement of something like 50,000 Catholics from uh, the northeast of Ireland into the south. You have probably uh, 20, 30,000 Protestants from the south, especially the border counties. Fermanagh has more southern Protestants than any other county in the 1920s. Um, so this, again, is part of the business of partition. But of course, uh, things are moving on. I mean, move suddenly to Belfast in June. Uh, this is Assemblies College, now Union Theological College, um, in, on the 7th of June, 1921. Because under the appointed days that had been arranged by the 1920 Government of Ireland Act, which became law and became operative, on the 3rd of May 1921, elections were held on the 22nd of May. They returned an overwhelming Unionist majority, just freezing it there. A lot of people, I was doing a program with UTV yesterday, and we were just saying that a lot of people don't know that for, um, you know, um, Really, 11 years, the Northern Ireland Parliament met not at Stormont, but in Union Theological College. The library upstairs, a beautiful library, uh, was the House of Commons. The chapel downstairs was the Senate, where Lord Londonderry unveiled his non-sectarian education policy. Uh, the building where the Special Powers Act and the abolition of PR for Stormont elections, all of that was passed, and largely passed in the absence of a nationalist presence. Because like the Ulster Unionists and their covenant, the nationalists and Sinn Féin and their manifestos in the elections of May 1921 said they would refuse to recognise this partition parliament in Belfast. The most moderate nationalist voice, that of Joe Devlin, um, a seasoned orator, uh, who knew Craig well uh, from Westminster, uh, he said that partition means national suicide. So, you know, you can imagine that uh, Northern nationalists were not going to accept 
partition or a unionist dominated state very easily at this time. And there's great resentment against the specials as border Protestants resent the, uh, if you like, um, overweening um, presence of the IRA in counties like Fermanagh and Tyrone during this period as well. Let's just have a look at the parliament that emerged. 40 unionists returned out of the 52 MPs, six nationalists, six Sinn Féin. Bad blood between the two wings of nationalism, uh, each blaming the other for this catastrophe, really, of partition. This is William Coote, the MP for South Tyrone, who was very much on the right. James Craig, just freezing it there. Craig had achieved his ambition. A parliament for a homeland in northeast Ulster. He's really just concerned with his own people. He has ex cabinet experience. He's described as the only member of the new Northern Ireland cabinet who has that administrative experience. He'd learned a lot, not a brilliant man, but he'd learned a lot at his father's boardroom table at Dunville's distillery in Belfast. Let it roll there. Um, and we see a few more of these cabinet ministers. And here we can see. Um, we'll see them in a minute. There's uh, J.M. Andrews, the linen magnate from North Dunn, Minister of Labour, a man who tried to make North-South relations work and tried to uh, bring about a degree of reconciliation after partition in 1922, future Prime Minister, of course. The next man, um, we'll see another in a minute. He's obviously, a, he's, he's, and this is H.M. Pollock, a liberal unionist, Minister Fund. This is the hard man. Let's just freeze it there. Richard Dawson Bates, a Coleraine solicitor who had been behind the Ulster Unionist Council, the organization of the UVF. Bates regarded all Catholics as nationalists, nothing strange about that, and all nationalists as enemies. He refused to use the telephones installment in 1934 when he discovered that a nationalist telephonist had been engaged. The British government would have preferred if the liberal uh, and more patrician Lord Londonderry of Mount Stewart had been at home affairs rather than education. And he's in charge of the specials, law and order. He will, of course, mastermind the abolition of PR and the abolition of um, uh, PR for local government. Lord Londonderry, you can see a look of disdain here. It said he had one foot in the 18th century and one foot on the 21st. But he believed that if uh, they got it right in the schools of Catholic and Protestant children were educated together, then many problems would be solved, except he was opposed by the churches. The Catholic Church opted out, their schools became voluntary, received no funding at all in the 1920s, and indeed Londonderry removed uh, Protestant church ownership from their former schools, uh, their, trust, their, their, their control of appointments, and he also removed the Bible from the schools. There was an outcry from the Protestant churches of the Orange Order, and London, D Londonderry's policy was overturned by James Craig in the Concord Act of 1925. And from then on, we have what one historian has called the endowment of Protestantism by the state. Roman Catholic schools were, you know, explicitly Catholic in every respect and were not paid, but um, state schools were effectively Protestant because they hired Protestant teachers and they involved simple Bible teaching, which was Protestant, the Protestant sort of interpretation of RE. Here you have Craig and his cabinet on the steps, but we move to a much greater event, um, if you like. Uh, two weeks later, when the King, George V, arrives in Belfast, as the King Corda said earlier, to unveil the new Northern Ireland Parliament in state in Belfast City Hall. The date is the 22nd of June, 1921. Uh, it's a key day on the calendar. It will be remembered this year, I'm sure, by many people, probably as the foundational moment in Northern Ireland, just as Easter Monday, 1916, uh, is remembered as the foundational moment in the history of the Republic of Ireland. And you can see here uh, the newspaper, Northern Parliament, opened by the King. The King was determined to make an impression. He wanted to use a speech to end the violence in Ireland. He wanted, if you like, peace and reconciliation between his Irish subjects, which is why he'd called the Buckingham Palace Conference um, a decade earlier to try to reconcile um, North and South on the eve of the First World War. He arrives on the Royal Yacht. He's greeted by the Prime Minister-designate James Craig and the, um, the first Catholic Viceroy, Lord Fitzalan former Conservative MP, as they arrive here uh, at uh, the port of Belfast. Queen Mary, very affrighted by all of the 
Belfast because Belfast had a reputation for vicious sectarian violence. The king told Craig, my advisors didn't want me to come. His speech, though, has been heavily, uh, if you like, overwritten by Lord George, by the South African Prime Minister, General Jan Smuts, who had met de Valera secretly to see what his bottom line was. And the idea was to stop the campaign of violence and reprisals and counter-reprisals which had been escalating in the South. The Church of England and others had condemned the official British policy of reprisals, which are very much uh, things like Bloody Sunday, for example, um, uh, at this time. And King arrives in the City Hall. It's what he says that day that makes the difference. He says he speaks from a a full heart. He calls on Irish men to forgive and forget, um, to act in a spirit of peace and reconciliation, and to seek for the land that they love, a new era of peace, contentment, and goodwill. Now, everybody in the room knows how difficult it is for Irish men uh, to forgive and forget. But the king is not speaking to his exclusively unionist and Protestant audience there. That's the Civil War and Derry one. Um, he's speaking to the southern leadership of Sinn Féin. He's speaking to Eamon de Valera, who returned from America in January, shocked by the horrors of the Anglo-Irish War, a man the British thought they can do business with, talking to Michael Collins, whom the British thought is the extremist, the man of blood. And of course, within a few days, Lord George is able to act in the spirit of the King's words. De Valera is invited to talks in London, a truce is arranged, and we have an opening to those long, fraught negotiations which result in the Anglo-Irish Treaty of the 6th of December 1921. Now, of course, violence continues in Northern Ireland because the the treaty negotiations are seen as an existential threat by the unionist population and as a matter for celebration, of course, by the nationalist population. You have a a raft of nationalist deputations from Derry, from Manor, the Glens of Antrim, to President de Valera in Dublin in the summer of 1920, asking for his support to ensure that they are included in the future independent Irish state. He's very circumspect in his promises. Their views will be kept in mind. But Collins, De Valera and others have been elected for northern constituencies. Of course, Griffith and Collins lead the negotiations. Uh, The real focus is on national status, the status of the Irish state. Partition comes a a poor second. Um, And in the end, the best that Collins and Griffith can get is a boundary commission to review the acreage of Northern Ireland. Plenty of boundary commissions have been held in Europe, but there's a difference with this one. Article 12 of the Treaty because it doesn't include the critical um, provision of a plebiscite, a vote of the population, internationally enforced. It's going to be very, very difficult to enforce border changes. And, of course, we can see that, you know, de Valera goes to London, just a few shots from that period before we move on, because we know that the year to come will be an even more violent one. The year after the treaty sees, of course, the drift to civil war in the South as Michael Collins establishes his fledgling government, the split in the Doyle over the treaty, the even more gargantuan split in the IRA as the bulk of the rank and file rally to the anti-treaty, the Republican cause, de Valera identifying with that, the IRA taking over the four courts, um, Kevin O'Higgins, one of Collins's uh, able deputy is talking about seven young men uh, forming a government in Dublin with wild men screaming through the keyhole. But as we move into 1922, Craig and Collins are able to sign two agreements and they meet three times. Now, Craig had met him in de Valera on the eve of partition in 1921. That meeting was unproductive. Um, but um, the rising violence on the borders of North and South Uh, which had a knock-on effect in Belfast in January, February 1922, as the IRA, of course, is splitting, and uh, the anti-treaty IRA are using the North, and the boycott of Belfast, which had been imposed by the Doyle in response to the Belfast violence, all of that has been reenacted, and trains are being stopped crossing the border, everything's destroyed except Bushmills whiskey and Gallagher's tobacco, and of course, this is hitting the smaller businessman in Belfast, who has a big distributing trade in the, in the south and west of Ireland very, very hard. But it doesn't touch the commanding heights of linen, shipbuilding and engineering. They rely on the British Empire, that free trade area. And Ernest Blythe, one of Collins's uh, ministers, who's a northerner from Lisburn, um, a Gaelgoer who'd embraced the Irish language, always did and saw it as common ground between north and south. He came from Maharagal and County Antrim. But he said that um, um, force and coercion would have as much impact on Ulster Protestantism as a spring shower would have on Cape And he came from that community himself. 
But as violence rises, Collins begins to, uh, if you like, um, follow a twin track policy on the North. On the one hand, he supports the IRA in the North, and most of the IRA may remain pro-treaty, including Charles Hawhey's father, for example, John Hawhey from Swatra, um, including the 3rd Northern Division in Belfast, the 4th Northern Division on the borders of Dundalk and South Armagh, led by Frank Aiken. They will remain loyal to the treaty as long as Collins gives them support. And Collins is prepared to support them and is talking really um, ambiguously about the treaty. Uh, if Lloyd George doesn't stop anti-Catholic attacks in Belfast, Quote, he can have his bloody treaty, he tells a deputation. This is Collins fighting powerfully on the public platform for the treaty in the early months of 1922. This is the Collins who meets Craig twice. He meets him in the colonial office in London in January to discuss the Boundary Commission, following serious violence um, on the uh, on the border and in Belfast. And they agree to, if you like, work out the border between themselves. This isn't popular with the border nationalists. They think uh, Collins has been led a merry dance by Craig. Uh, violence escalates again. They meet again in February. And finally, of course, the violence escalates in March 1922. You have the ambushing of a train of beast specials at Clona Station. Um, many of them are kidnapped and brought to uh, Irish army barracks in the south. You have the, 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 the killing of the little girls playing at a lamppost in Weaver Street in North Belfast by a loyalist bomb. You have the bombing of a Protestant family in North Belfast, several fatalities. And then you have the Mike Mahon murders, where uh, an eminent Catholic businessman, um, four of his sons and an employee, are shot to death almost certainly by members of the police and the specials in their own home uh, on Belfast Antrim Road on the 24th of March. That triggers a response. Churchill, who's in charge of Irish affairs, invites Collins, uh, Craig and members of their cabinet to the colonial office. And they sign the second Craig Collins Pact, which has the rubric, peace is today declared. It proposes the reform of the police, the recruitment of Catholic specials. Uh, Collins says he will end IRA violence. He'll end the boycott. Craig says he'll try to reinstate the uh, 8,000 Catholic workers who had lost their job. But now we're into a post-war recession, so that's going to be very difficult. Um, and in the end, of course, this pact, that it's, it's, it's a Churchillian phrase, peace is today declared as its opening line is washed away in a sea of blood as North and South again come to daggers drawn. It's during these years, of course, that critical laws are passed in an exclusively unionist parliament. For example, it's during this period, of course, that the Education Act is introduced by London Derry uh, as a non-denominational act, but it's eventually unpicked by 1925. And we have two sets of schools. The Catholic schools don't get any grand aid until 1930. And only then, because they threaten to take their case, which they believe proves that the government of Ireland's religious safeguard, government of Ireland Act's religious safeguard has been breached to the House of Lords. They get 50% grant. That will rise, of course, in subsequent years. The Special Powers Act is introduced to deal with a, a mounting IRA campaign in 1922. But then, of course, the specials have been active as well. South Armagh sees some terrible murders including the murder of six Protestant civilians by the IRA uh, in the little village of Alton Vey in June 1922. Um, it's a very, very bloody violent period, of course. And of course, then, of course, you have the uh, introduction of the Special Powers Act. It enables internment. It's directed almost exclusively at nationalists and the IRA. And of course, 700 people are interned on the prison ship Argenta. But of course, there are there's a sense of a dual security policy, that floggings are remitted in the case of loyalists, if you look at the records, but not in the case of alleged Republicans. And of course, PR is abolished that summer for local government elections. Now, this is one of the big nationalist safeguards. PR had enabled Sinn Féin and the Nationalist Party to command the councils of Fermanagh, Tyrone, um, the old Derry, London Dairy Corporation, uh, Newry, other areas. And now it's been removed. Collins complains to Churchill that Craig is trying to paint the counties of Fermanagh and Tyrone in a deep orange hue in anticipation of the Boundary Commission. That's another issue. The Boundary Commission is a shadow overhanging the scene, destabilizing things. Craig rejects it. The North has been automatically included in the Free State, which is why you can get Irish passports before the Good Friday Agreement. Um, Craig, Craig is incensed by this, that Lord George had forced the North to opt out of the Free State. 
So, I mean, until the 7th of December 1922, the people of Balamina, the people of Larne, uh, the people of um, uh, Ahur were all members of the Irish Free State. Um, and of course, uh, by that summer, the Irish Civil War erupts. And we're going to see on the tape what a hard border looked like in 1922, because as on the brink of the Irish Civil War, um, parties of the IRA loyal to Michael Collins invaded um, the bleak Pedigo Triangle of South uh, West Fermanagh. Um, uh, as you know, Pedigo is a village divided by the border, it used to be described as Ireland Berlin, though it hardly merits that, a few hundred people, and different time zones, by the way, on either side of the river during the Second World War. And then you have the village of Bleak, with the famous 18th century potter. Of course, uh, Bleak was, was nationalist, Pedigo was unionist, they end up on different sides of the border. Nationalist Bleak in Northern Ireland, um, Protestant Pedigo in Southern Ireland. And of course, as the IRA invade, um, Northern Ireland Territory, Churchill sends in the artillery. And we can see the troops marching into Donegal here after they had used howitzers to blast the IRA out of Balik, Balik Battery. Balik Battery was just across the river in County Donegal. It overlooks the village, an ancient fort. Here's the armoured cars moving into Donegal. The British will hold Pedigo for another three years. They shell the area. It's like a scene from the Western Front. This could have been the Battle of the Somme. It's absolutely incredible. And we're about to see there's the uh, unchanging face of Belik and nationalist South Fermanagh. And we're about to see, of course, um, the uh, British forces maybe moving and accompanied by Sir Basil Brooke, uh, a unionist landlord, a World War I officer and founder of the B Specials as Fermanagh Vigilant. Um, on his uh, Cold Brook estate in 1922. Brook is the man in mufti with the hat, um, and you may see him accompanying the brass hats. There he is there on the left, moving into Donegal. This is incredible. And of course, this causes a lot of ill feeling. It almost brings Ireland to the brink of a different civil war, a North-South Civil War. And women don't get much of a say in history, but Anne's going to show us finally of course, uh, a scene from the Battle of Belique, when the Honourable Helen Laverton, this is Laverton long forgotten, an Anglo-Irish lady who'd married into the Johnson family of Belique County Fermanagh, um, operated uh, her own kind of launch during the Battle of Belique, ferrying the specials across to the Donegal shore. The old road went through Donegal territory, getting from Enniskill, and she's known as Ulster's gallant woman, Admiral, and here she is, um, captured, um, in, 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 in time, um, in June 1922, her boat, the Pandora, there's the Beast Specials on board as it makes its way over. She's 40 something then. She would die in the 1950s in Abbey Leaks in the centre of Ireland, where she'd secondly married an aristocrat and reared his family, never accepting either Irish independence or the partition of Ireland. And of course, it's not until the civil war breaks out in 1922 that the northern violence begins to end. Shocking months, May and June, Churchill talked about cannibalism, except um, the uh, perpetrators, a word we still hear, stopped short of devouring the flesh of their victims by the late summer of 1922. As the South enters civil war, and Michael Collins dies violently, de Valera's a hunted man on the run, um, Belfast and uh, and dairy and the rest come to a kind of a uh, a kind of a, a, a semi normality. The curfew still applies. So it's in these angry early years that so many of the issues um, that form the kind of foundational acts of Northern Ireland are created, and of course they will cast a long shadow in the future. It's not to 1925 that Joe Devlin takes a seat. Maybe we could see Joe Devlin in those days. They had a great idea for a cross community event in Belfast just after the troubles. They called it a Celtic carnival, and that brought together the Ulster Scots, uh, Celts from Scotland by and large, and the, the Gaelic Irish, if you like. I'm not sure what happened to the Normans and the Huguenots, but anyway, they had a Celtic a carnival in Belfast. And it's not only opened by the Lord Mayor, who's a unionist, but it's opened by Wee Joe Devlin, who has just taken his seat in the Northern Ireland Parliament. He becomes one of its star orators, has a good working relationship with Craig, but it's not until 1927 that the border nationalists from Derry, from Anna and Tyrone take their seats. We can see the Lord Mayor's show, it wasn't called that then. A bit of normality after the troubles as Northern Ireland settles down and uh, we'll see the platform finally. And we'll see Joseph Devlin, who became synonymous with Irish nationalism in Ulster. There he is on the left from 
the early 1900s until his death in 1934. When he died, Ireland was united for one day, as they often said. Uh, but um, James Craig would become prime minister, and he would, of course, remain in power for until 1940. Uh, being succeeded by one of his ministers, J.M. Andrews. By then, of course, the mould of unionism had been established. Here's Wee Jo, uh, now approaching his 60s, the MP for West Belfast, a popular figure who'd achieved a lot for the mill girls of, of uh, the city of Belfast. Um, so critical period, looking back, I try to be as fair as I can. Uh, thank you very much, Anne, for your help as ever with the screen. Um, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Well, Eamon, once again, thank you very, very much for a very uh, informative lecture. Lots of information, lots of light in the dark corners, lots of uh, examples of the complexities of our circumstances back then and to some extent continuing on to this very day. Just to want to make two quick points. Speaker Hoyle has just actually had to leave the meeting a couple of minutes ago and gives us apologies. He has worked in Westminster to turn to this evening. And uh, we also had some technical problems, I believe, for some of our participants earlier. But please be sure that we will have recorded tonight's event and that will be placed on the Assembly website. So, I mean, I have a few questions uh, lined up. Um, one would be from George, who uh, had co commented earlier on, just querying uh, Eamon around uh, maybe a speculation next as to what may have happened had Home Rule been accepted. And the second question from Paul Nugent, would be uh, in respect of Woodrow Wilson, would his attitude have been in any way affected from his, uh, would it be reflective of his statutory heritage? You mentioned him earlier on about the the, uh, the, the peace talks, for example. Well, when, when we look back, I mean, uh, somebody said about the Home Rule Bill of uh, 1886 or uh, the final Home Rule Bill, which became law and passed on to the statute book with the King's signature in um, September 1914, just as the war broke out. Um, looking back, it's harder to see why unionists rejected Home Rule than why nationalists were so uproariously rejoicing about Home Rule, because it gave very limited powers to an Irish parliament. I mean, they had no control over the forces of the Crown, who were still at the Curra and Thiepval Barracks and Oma and elsewhere. They had no control over finance, the post office, the RIC. They had some control over education and agriculture and things like that. But it certainly wasn't independence. And they still would, would be sending MPs to Westminster, as they did, of course, from Northern Ireland after 1921. Um, and of course, the reason why unionists reacted was, well, there didn't, there hadn't been any, if you like, meeting of minds in Ulster, uh, really from the 17th century, apart from a brief period in a very localised way in the 1790s, when Belfast, if you like, pioneered the ideals of the French Revolution, um, liberty, equality, fraternity. You had the United Irishmen, people like Dr. William Drennan joining forces with a Protestant lawyer from Dublin, Wolf Tom. That wasn't universal, but it did affect significant numbers of Presbyterian. But that spirit was lost, of course, after the Act of Union. And the politics of the 19th century were deeply sectarian. I mean, Daniel O'Connell wasn't a bigot, but he relied on the Catholic masses and the Catholic Church. Um, Henry Cook, of course, was the proto-unionist of the period, and he stood against what he termed nationalism, liberalism, and popery. And they established the lines, really, to kind of tribal camps. There were always Protestant home rulers, never a large majority, people like Armour of Balamani, people like Davy Hogg, the shirt manufacturer in Derry, who won the seat in uh, 1900 and. Uh, 12, uh, the kind of uh, old Londonderry seat, people like um, Jeremiah Jordan, an Enniskillen Methodist shopkeeper who was MP for South Fermanagh. We could go on, but they were still a minority and they tended to be, you know, wealthy middle class individuals. Um, the ordinary shipyard worker, the ordinary farm labourer, the ordinary strong farmer generally was uh, pro union in his views. So it was the fear of home rule. And the fear that the Catholic Church, particularly fresh after the McCann case of 1910, in which the Ney Temere decree introduced for the Catholic Church, not in Germany where it might divide people, but in Ireland where it was definitely going to divide people, it applied to the um, McCann family marriage in Belfast, a Presbyterian woman married to uh, Mr. McCann, and he disappeared with the children. She never saw um, uh, Mrs. McCann, never saw her children again. She became a kind of a, a, a pathetic victim of the home rule crisis and very much a propaganda icon for, for unionism at that time. So the ordinary rank and file Protestant really did fear by 1910 that home rule was home rule. 
Had there been a Tory government, Gladstone's aim in 1886 was that home rule would be very limited. There would be a second chamber which would represent the landed gentry and the Protestant churches in Ireland. That's really what happened, really, with the Irish Senate after 1922. We forget that um, uh, Southern Protestants, though only 12% of the population, had 50% of the seats in the Free State Senate. That was a concession negotiated by Lord Middleton of the Anglo-Irish gentry with Arthur Griffith. And that continued to de Valera, abolished it in 1936. So in many ways, Gladstone wanted, if you like, a balance of the different populations in Ireland. But he realised after two attempts, he couldn't deliver home rule. And he turned to the Marquess of Salisbury, the Conservative Prime Minister, and said, look, can you bring this in? It's the only thing will solve the Irish problem. It's the only thing will save the demands of Irish nationalists for some form of local patriotism. Salisbury realised to pilot a home rule bill would be to split his own party. It, Gladstone has split the Liberal Party. And the English working man, uh, you know, was always divided on the question of Irish home rule. There'd been anti-Irish riots in Britain. Religion as an issue didn't die out in Britain until quite late in the 19th century. Um, that's an issue there. So had home rule came about, of course, um, had we had a, had a Good Friday type approach to home rule, it might have been very different. If nationalism from an early stage had realised the need to, if you like, win over Protestants to the cause. But nationalists tended to think too much in terms that this will work okay and it'll be a, ma a majority government. It's only later, during the Irish Convention of 1918, that people like Redmond and Devlin begin to talk about concessions. And they offer 40% of the seats in a Home Rule Parliament to the Protestants of Ireland in 1918. Something that could only have been done by massive gerrymandering. But even that didn't win majority. Uh, you know, any sizable Protestant support for Home Rule. So in many ways, you know, the failure of reconciliation after the, the, the sort of the hope of the 1790s, when there was this pluralist nationalism informed by revolutionary ideas from outside, that was the only time. Um, somebody asked me something else there. That's the first question. Sorry, there was a second question. Carson's disappearance. I'll pick up on Derek's point there. Um, well, um, uh, nice to see Derek in the room. Um, he and I have walked this ground in Dublin with a group from his council area some years ago. Carson disappears because I think two things. He cites age and infirmity, you know, um, and the toils of the Irish struggle. But really, Carson would not have become prime minister of a Northern Ireland parliament because Carson, the Southern Unionist, who for 25 years had represented a Dublin seat at Westminster, who went back to speak, uh, and he addressed meetings against Home Rule in Ive House in Dublin, then the seat of the Guinness family, now the seat of the Department of Foreign Affairs. I mean, Carson was a Southern Unionist by birth, tradition, education, inclination, family friendships, his school, his school friends are your friends forever. His were the doctors, the lawyers, and the landlord's sons from Kerry, Cork, and Clare. And they were writing to Carson after 1914. Have you forgotten your own people? So to preside over the 1920 Act and end his days as Prime Minister of a Parliament in Belfast would be to preside over the ruins of his own policy. I think Carson had got the best deal he could for his Ulster Unionist clients. He couldn't get them 32 counties, which he would have aspired to, nine counties. He got them six counties, and he left them to it by large. Though a kind of a cult develops in the 20s and 30s, the cult of Carsonism, with James Craig as a kind of a high priest. Carson has brought over and carefully rationed limited doses to open the Silent Valley waterworks, to unveil his own statue. But a very, very telling comment. Um, Carson's grandchildren, both uh, grand old ladies in the 80s, came over about seven or eight years ago and the BBC brought me down to meet them. And they told me that the day Carson unveiled that statue in 1933 was a cold, bleak day. And he suffered terribly from depression in his last year, disappointed in his family, many of whom his sons had been expelled from school. Um, he said, my family are a rum lot. And he wouldn't accept a, a hereditary period because he felt someone in his family might disgrace him. His was a life peerage. So when he unveiled the statue that day, he was invited into the, you know, the sparkling new parliament buildings for refreshment. And he declined. He said, no, he had a slight chill. But his family interpreted this to mean that really he couldn't stomach going in because it symbolised his failure to save his own people. And of course, in his speech in the House of Lords um, in December 1921, as the treaty, which really gave the South virtual independence, give his part of Ireland, you know, independence under the tricolour. 
Uh, he was very bitter as he turned on his former colleagues, Bono Law and F.E. Smith. And he said, you know, what a fool I was. So was Ulster and so was Ireland in the game that was to bring the Conservative Party into power. I was only a puppet. These lines quoted, of course, by Ian Blackford of the um, um, Scottish Nationalist Party during the, uh, if you like, the Brexit debates a few years ago when he was actually having a poke at um, Ulster Unionism or the DUP at that time. But you remember those lines. That was Carson's settled view. Partition was never what he wanted, though he facilitated um, as the best deal he could get from the wreckage of um, the union. There was a question there, uh, Eamon, from uh, Paul Nugent around was Woodrow Wilson's views uh, on the question of Ireland being involved in the peace talks, but that had been a, a reflection of a Scots Irish heritage. Ireland being involved in, what's that again, sorry? I think you were talking about the peace talks after the war and uh, Woodrow Wilson didn't support. Ah, yes, yes, yes. Uh, very interesting point. I mean, Woodrow Wilson, of course, was of Ulster Presbyterian um, stock. He is one of those kind of 13 to 15 um, US pre presidents who have um, a Northern Irish background, you know. Uh, there's a cottage somewhere in the province of Ulster, anyway, for most of these guys, and he was one of them. Um, uh, but of course, um, he was a Democrat. Um, and for the previous two years, Eamon de Valera had toured the United States and Canada, being feted by the Democratic Party. Uh, senators, governors, mayors of cities had given de Valera the key, and he stood on the platform proclaiming uh, an Irish Republic, and obviously uh, name checking himself as the president of that republic as uh, decreed by Dáil Éireann. But of course, he's accompanied for part of that journey, by the way, by a, a Presbyterian minister from actually, um, I suppose, be the modern East Derry, East London Derry, a man uh, called the Reverend James Hamilton Erwin from Banner, outside the Maiden City. Uh, he was a Presbyterian minister at Khalid, near the airport in County Antrim. He was a Republican. Uh, he was very popular with his flock, but he actually toured America with Dáil Éireann uh, in support of an Irish Republic at that time. Now, Dáil Éireann, got everything except a meeting with the president. Uh, and his aim was to get American presidential recognition of an Irish Republic as proclaimed by Don Aaron. Um, now, uh, another president might have done it. Uh, he failed to achieve, if you like, what uh, uh, the Irish government and Irish nationalism achieved in 1994 when they got Bill Clinton on side with those uh, that sort of Irish pressure group which produced, you know, the Irish kind of uh, peace envoy idea and eventually brought the American presidency into the Northern Ireland question. So the 1990s saw achieved really what de Valera and Michael Collins failed to achieve because, um, uh, if you like, uh, Wilson set great store by a stable world after the First World War. It was his 14 points in 1917 that had brought a reluctant Germany to the conference table. Um, he talked about self-determination for small nations, which resonated with Sinn Féin, but probably also with Ulster Unionism. They were thinking of self-determination outside an Irish state as well. And certainly Wilson didn't want to strain the bonds of this new friendship between the two world powers, if you like, uh, Britain and uh, America, because uh, he believed, although his policy was rejected by Congress afterwards, he believed that if they were going to police this new world order where tyr tyranny would have been overthrown, and there would be freedom of the seas and freedom for um, people struggling for their independence. He would need the assistance of Great Britain. I want to thank everybody for their attendance this evening. And I'd like to acknowledge a number of MLAs from all of the parties actually past and present who have signed on for tonight's event. Andrew Muir, Paula Bradley, Melissa McHugh, Roy Beggs, Gregory Campbell, Sean Farron and Derek Hussey. All will be well known to most of the people who have tuned in tonight. So again, I want to thank everybody and thank the staff here as well for in the assembly for putting this event together. Uh, I want to particularly thank Eamon Phoenix, uh, Speaker Hoyle and Kion Corla, Sean O'Farrell. And could just to basically say that the next lecture that we have on offer is on Wednesday, the 12th of May, 2021, of course, at 7 p.m. when Eamon will focus uh, on the unionist and the loyalist perspective. And I hope so without any further ado, I'd just like to wish us all a very good night and thank you all for participating in tonight's seminar. Thank you all very, very, very much. EOI. Thank you very much, and thank you very much, Alan. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you.